In 2018, she sponsored Ohio's Heartbeat Bill, which would penalize doctors for performing an abortion when a fetal heartbeat can be detected, so after six weeks. <laughs> The bill was designed not only to drastically decrease the abortion rate, but was also crafted specifically to challenge Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court decision that made abortion a constitutional right in the US. I started following Christina when she, closely when she put forward the bill, but when a photo went viral that showed abortion activists screaming and cursing at her as she pushed a stroller with her newborn twins into the Ohio legislature to defend her bill, I knew I had to meet her. <laughs> to me, she is everything a pro-life politician should strive to be. Caring, compassionate, bold, and courageous, and a good dresser. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Please welcome former, former Ohio State Representative Christina Hagen. quite like that. Um, I obviously paid Alyssa in advance to say all those wonderful kind things. To be completely honest, um, every time I get in front of a room like this, I just have to have so much praise and gratitude to God for all of the experiences he's given me. And I've never sat in that seat and saw that slideshow, so I have to be even more grateful for my beautiful life because when you're living in those moments, you don't really realize how beautiful it is. And we just went through a month of sick babies, so there was a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of puke, a lot of things I won't discuss today. Um, so when I see their beautiful smiling faces and I see all the amazing opportunities we've had, and I look into this crowd and I see all of the amazing, wonderful people here, I truly feel gratitude in my heart. And it's such a joy to be here with all of you tonight. And I keep looking at the amazing amount of collaboration that's happening here in Canada, thinking about Life Canada, We Need a Law, Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform, and also right now, all of you being here together in this room and all of the volunteers that support these initiatives and these organizations. And I just can't help to, to tell you that you've worked so hard to be where you are in such a difficult position, and that's so admirable because I can't say that I had this experience where there was this overwhelming room of support. And so I just think of your members of parliament um, and your me members of your legislative assemblies and how supported and blessed they must feel to have people like you who believe in them, who are ready to knock doors and ready to be beside them. I didn't have this type of collaborative effort behind me, but really that's a story for another day. I'll be honest, composing the speech was pretty difficult. And I never knew how much I was pouring into my life, into this movement, until I tried to condense it. In eight years of raw emotion, fierce dedication, testimonials, debates, interviews, wins, and tough, tough losses, and a discussion to have over one dinner. And in the thick of our work, we never really know just how much a moment of courage can change. And I can't believe I'm finally saying this, but in Ohio, we set out to end abortion, and we did it. <laughs> Nearly every single abortion that took place in our state will now stop. And even more exciting is the fact that in our lifetime, we may see the heartbeat law be the arrow that pierces the heart of Roe v. Wade. And in five decades of suffering, and violent destruction done to American women and children. Did you have any idea that statistically speaking, the most dangerous place in the entire world for an American child to be is right in her womb, her mother's womb? I'm going to repeat that. A mother's womb has become the most dangerous place in America for a baby to be. In a time where culture demands that you can be anything, a biological male can be a woman, and a biological woman can be a male. But the world won't let a baby in the womb simply be a baby. This is crazy. The American womb is 160 times more dangerous than the most dangerous city in the entire world. You gotta be kidding me, right? Throughout the whole of US history, approximately 2.2% of our military personnel who actually served in wartime were killed in the line of duty. 
Babies don't even want conflict, yet they're living in it. What does all of this mean? Even if you lived in the world's most dangerous city, or engaged in the worst or most tragic American conflicts of war, your odds of survival will never be lower than they were when you lived in your mother's womb as an American. In terms of scale, death by abortion, unparalleled, is unparalleled by any other atrocity in the entire world. If this is this unsafe in America, where we have laws of protection for babies and women on the books, how dangerous is it for a Canadian woman and child where no such laws yet exist? Passing the heartbeat law allowed us to overcome this horrendous reality in Ohio and expand the greatest margin of protection to unborn children that our law has ever seen. And now that we've protected all children with beating hearts, it's time to go back for every single person thereafter. We can achieve so much in a moment of courage. And think, if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? I want to tell you, it may be difficult. It will. It is. A person may not be ready to receive your message. Prime Minister Trudeau may not be ready to receive your message. The world may not be ready to receive your message, but you can never underestimate the power that planting a seed can have. The seed that I helped to plant is sweeping across the nation. A single moment of courage, one tiny David and Goliath moment, okay, maybe a few, became an arrow that will likely pierce the heart of Roe v. Wade. But we didn't get here on our own. I want to tell you about my story and why I decided to lead on the heartbeat bill. Janet Porter was the author of the heartbeat bill along with Dr. John Wilkie, the founder of the National Right to Life. Janet is the reason that this bill is being passed, heard, and vetted across our country, and now internationally. She came up with a very ba basic concept that if a heartbeat is detected, a baby should be protected. And that is something that all Americans and all people of all nationalities should be able to agree on. Well, I was two weeks onto the job, as Alyssa mentioned, the youngest female legislator in the history of the state. And I had to cast two of the most controversial votes that the legislature had ever seen. We were in the midst of historic budget deficits and a sharp change of leadership, and the heartbeat bill came across my desk, and I was immediately a yes vote. After all, I came to protect the innocent and reform our government. Voting yes was very easy for me. For other legislators, that wasn't necessarily the case. What I watched happen next, though, was very eye-opening. The bill was intentionally stalled and killed in a Republican trifecta. I couldn't believe that we had a Republican-dominated House, Senate, and Governor's office, and we weren't going to seamlessly protect the unborn. I watched nauseatingly over the next several months and years as games were played, and the bill was attacked by leaders in our very own movement. I was stunned. Janet Porter called me, asking for a meeting, and she planted a seat. She told me that the movement needed me and that we were going to have to go to war to protect these babies with beating hearts. She prayed with me, encouraged me, and let me know that she believed this was my Esther moment, that I could help by being the one willing to end abortion. I told her that I would take it into prayer and serious consideration, but I knew deep down that I had to do that, and I was just afraid of the unknown, to be honest, of my inadequacies, of my insecurities, and to be frank, what it would cost. I selfishly wanted to be known for economic-related issues, and not painted into a corner for being a pro-life legislator. I started praying daily and asking God for guidance and wisdom and direction until almost half a year went by. And you could guess, but Janet never stopped calling. I got really good about moving her to the back burner, and she knew it. Um, I wanted to stay in my comfort zone, and she knew it. But it was at a Stark County Right to Life dinner, a dinner just like this, that my whole world changed. I heard the story of Gianna Jessen. You probably saw her image up there, and if you don't know who Gianna is, you need to know her. But I heard Gianna's story about being burned alive in her mother's womb, surviving her intended death, and how she's living fiercely now to glorify God for her existence. It was her testimony that God had sent, and it stirred every ounce of reservation that I had experienced and that I was clinging to nourishing the seed that Janet had planted and shaking me to the core to leave every insecurity behind and suit up for advancing his kingdom, not mine. We know for certain
certain that he or she has a beating heart? If the unborn child has a beating heart, how can we be the ones who allow for that beating heart to be stopped? We know that the heart is pumping, and we continue to pretend that this child has no independent qualities of the mother. Medical science is on our side, and scripture clearly lays out the value of the child in the womb. I just kept hearing, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. I was the youngest member of the legislature, and many senior legislators set out to warn me that I should not go down this path. Many people who I had previously admired did everything they could to stop me from carrying the bill. They warned that Governor Kasich didn't want it, muddying up his political aspirations to be president of the United States. And I continue to wonder why we would be expected to carry the water for a person whom we didn't even represent, especially a person whose aspirations meant sacrificing protections for children being violently destroyed. I was told this was a bad plan and that I had a bright political future and that carrying this bill would compromise any goals that I might have. I was told that this was a lightning rod politically and I shouldn't touch it. Inevitably, I was quickly punished for doing so and they were certain to make me fall on the sword politically. I felt the weight of all of this hatred and felt so alone because it was there, but they weren't voicing it publicly. So I remained professional and courteous in hopes of breaking through and for fair treatment on all of my other proposals. The governor, who was diligently working around the clock to kill my bill, and me politically along with it, had no problem swooping up my newborn child at the state of the state. I kept praying and thinking, maybe, just maybe, he will have a change of heart. I asked him for meetings, for phone calls, for consideration, none of which were ever granted. Sadly, no matter the petition, that was not going to happen. Ostracized by our local and state party leadership for being too pro-life and too conservative. Punished by the Senate president for putting him in the position where he would have to kill the pro-life bill in order to protect the sitting governor. A Senate president that was from the most pro-life district in the entire state of Ohio. But the terms, but the two terms and harsh political games continued. And finally, after having a massive breakthrough, I believe due to the harsh pushback from the public for its lack of movement and getting the bill passed out of the Senate in a lame duck session, the bill was swiftly vetoed by the governor without so much as even a courtesy call. Hearts broke all across Ohio. Day after day, we would keep reading the news and wonder how our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our actions could become so calloused toward innocent unborn children. Asking God how any person could knowingly or purposefully choose death over life. No matter the circumstance, no matter the heartache, no form of murder is a more just way of navigating an inconvenient or, or challenging circumstance. We need to pray daily that God will touch every heart and change every mind when it comes to the worth of an individual. I knew our work for women and children is not to create controversy, but to create hope and healing. The eyes may be open and in turn lives may be welcomed instead of destroyed and violently dismantled. I clung to Corinthians because we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but in despair, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. And struck down, but not destroyed. I continue to carry the bill. I re reintroduced it again and again and again. And you wouldn't believe the disbelief in the media and the party that I would challenge our governor and try to advance protection of children with beating hearts once more, even though I knew very well that he disapproved. I couldn't believe that a handful of people could stand in the way of 20,000 children being protected. I couldn't believe that our life movement was so fractured. And I couldn't believe how willing pro-lifers were to throw bombs at the legislation. It got to the point where I felt hated by so many. Some for advancing a pro-life bill at all, some for not going far enough, and some were believing I went too far. There was really no one that I could please. I learned to walk in my faith and feel okay with God guiding me in grace. Although I felt rejected by the world, it was God's grace and guidance that kept me fighting for babies and their mothers no matter the cost. If it wasn't bad enough that our team was split, the real opposition, those who wish to keep abortion on demand, well, they loathe me. <laughs> and I, like you, I'm sure, have been laughed at and scoffed at and jeered at for being pro-life. 
being judged loudly as only pro-birth and being consistently and constantly told that I really don't care about children once they're born. I heard terrible, awful, unforgivable things for leaving on this bill. Voicemails were left in my office that I wouldn't read to my worst enemy. But the interesting thing about that is, I don't see any of those people here tonight. I see loving, caring, compassionate do-gooders. I don't, I don't believe that those people know how to love people wholly. So honestly, you all are the unsung heroes in this story. Feeling alone and often inadequate, part of me felt like I could never win, but I just kept remembering that I was working for the Lord and not for the approval of man, and that these precious babies, well, they needed me. So I kept fighting, and I had been fighting for so long that I can barely even recognize the young girl who started carrying this bill, because she wasn't married yet, and she certainly didn't have three beautiful children. I debated and held my ground through nine months of pregnancy, not once, but twice, and with a singleton, and then lastly, while working to overturn the governor's vetoes and his will, I carried my twin sons both in me and also with me, and their presence was always a testimony in itself. I will never forget feeling my daughter's hiccups as I stood on the house floor and debated to protect lives of the unborn, and she and every child like her continued to be dismissed as choices by my opposition. I knew that we stood literally for both women and children, for the rights of individuals born and unborn. I stood for every woman who had ever testified in support of the bill. For the women who stop me nearly everywhere I go, often quietly sharing one's heartache and lifelong regret about their personal but heartbreaking abortion. Their moment of sharing, by the way, is the opposite of shouting one's abortion. Devastated by the loss of her child and the scars on her heart. These moments, their words, and the untold stories of precious children who will never be here to make their mark will forever be a part of who I am and why I stood. I will carry their banner everywhere I go because every person deserves a voice and every heart deserves to be. And I know this is why the pro-life movement is so strong because we can look into the eyes of any woman in any room whether she is pro-choice, post-abortive, staunchly pro-life, or conflicted and undecided, and say, I know you because I am you. I wasn't afraid anymore. I was determined to empower women to care about all life as much as the pro-choice movement empowers women to care only about their life. So I worked tirelessly and against all odds to get the bill passed out of both chambers in my last term, recognizing we would need to overcome the governor's veto once again. This would be immensely difficult and the political waters were deep, but I knew with God that all things were and are always possible. Political games continued to be played and votes were delayed by leadership in order to make it near impossible to get the bill turned around in time for a veto override. They knew I could do it, but not if they created enough minds, obstacles, and pressured enough members to flip or withhold their votes. They are always prepared to defeat you before you ever start if you go against their will. I worked harder than I have ever worked in my entire life. I reached out to every single member that would allow me their time, and I presented my case and I made my plea. And I came up two votes short of the necessary override the night before the House vote. I kept calling and calling on my drive to Columbus that next morning and praying and presenting members with the facts, trying to walk them past the political pressures I knew they were receiving. And within a half hour of the floor vote, my lost votes, they flipped back and they decided to stand for life. This shocked the Senate. They kept passively claiming that they would take up the bill if it ever got to them. They were pretty cavalier about it. They were sure that the fix was in in the House. God moved that mountain. And you should have seen them scrambling. They finally told me that they couldn't take up the bill, although we had the necessary votes from previous counts and commitments present. Um, this was two weeks that it went by in the same chamber and they couldn't take up the vote suddenly. I pleaded with the Senate president, who didn't wish to disclose who had flipped, and I told him maybe, just maybe, if he held the vote that the convictions of the legislators would matter more. So after intense discussion, we held the vote, and to the shock of all in the room, one senator had flipped and Bill Beagle cost the bill to fail. 
We all knew that we'd be back because Governor DeWine had cam campaigned on signing the heartbeat bill. But to think a moment lacking courage cost the lives of so many for causing several more months of delay. I wouldn't want to be that person. Eight years had gone by, and I didn't regret a single one of them. I did the work that God had intended for me to do with the power that he had given me. The bill was swiftly taken up, passed, and signed into law within months of me finishing my last, last term. It seemed so surreal, but I couldn't be more grateful for this gift of life. The seed I helped plant is sweeping across our nation. A moment of courage, a single David and Goliath moment, is now an arrow headed toward the heart of Roe v. Wade. You and I may never be remembered as heroes. I mean, I wasn't even invited to the governor's bill signing on the bill that I poured most of my adult life into championing. But happiness in life is about focusing on what isn't about focusing on what life didn't give you. Instead, joy comes from witnessing who we can give life to. I didn't get a pen to commemorate my work at this milestone, and I was devastated at first. But then I remembered every single one of you. I remembered how much you do and how little recognition you receive. I remembered my friends Ashley and Victoria, who empower women globally with university scholarships, helping over 100 women get higher education. I remembered our friends at ICU Mobile in Akron, who send medical ministry right into the heart of America's most abortion-minded communities, meeting vulnerable women right where they are. That they would take a mobile unit from Akron, Ohio, to show the world in Times Square a live 4D ultrasound to the, of the child in the womb. And that the woman who volunteered to share a glimpse of her unborn child would be Abby Johnson, a former Planned Parenthood abortion clinic leader who has left the industry behind her and is now passionately supporting the heartbeat bill. A woman who once ran an abortion clinic, now allowing her child's heartbeat to be heard to save lives. What could be more beautiful than that? I remember my friend Jessica Stern, co-founder of Connect Our Kids. She works every single day to bring data and technology into the foster care space, to increase efficiency and speed of placement, to one day soon eradicate our broken system, so that every child in need in America can have a loving, permanent home. But mostly, I remembered you, all of the people who are giving, supporting, fighting for, and standing beside women and children every single day of the year, and fighting a battle that feels impossible most days, and in a country where no protections exist at all. I feel honored to work with each of you and to support missions like yours that radically transform the way we love and care for people. Diligently advocating so intentionally and wholeheartedly, we should all be so very proud. And I wanna tell you, it's not my story. It's all of our success story. It's your boots on the ground, it's your hands continuing to lift women up. And it's all of our prayers that sustain our dedication for life. Our fight for human decency starts in the womb, but the work that is being done here tonight fortifies our passion and love for those who need us the most on the outside. It is in these small, sometimes unnoticed moments of courage that we can make the vulnerable feel safe again, and that we can change the course of humanity. That change starts here, and my dear Canadian friends, change is in the air. So I think we all tend to pick these really amazing leaders in history who we identify with and also admire. Mine was Margaret Thatcher, daughter of a grocer, common person who became prime minister and changed the course of history. My modern day favorites are Lila Grace Rose of Live Action, Kristen Mercer Hawkins of Students for Life of America, Gianna Jessen, Alyssa Gola, of right now. <laughs> but truly, we each need to be the person that our children identify with and admire for how we took the stand that was needed in our time. Not because we are to be adored, like Alyssa, but because someone <laughs> has to do what is right and our children need to see this happening now more than ever. What I think we find in common about all of these great leaders is they acted in one moment of courage and never stopped fighting for who they knew needed them. My mother, for us, for kids, for the foster children who we are, called, we are blessed to call brothers and sisters. The little old woman at church for the blankets and booties that she knits for newborn babies. 
the everyday warriors, those volunteers that sit with women in the darkest hours in pregnancy resource centers as they help them to see the light in their lives again. These normal people are doing extraordinary work, and they are always, always, they are always, always, always the reason when change is in the air. When we fail to act on the things that God has placed on our hearts, we not only rob ourselves of our potential to shape history for the better, but we rob the future generations from their potential to shape history as well. Because quite frankly, we fail to execute on our calling. There are a lot of conferences, there are a lot of causes, and there are a lot of things that make us good stewards of our lives. But when you and I don't fight, when each of us in this room don't fight, it means that children with irreplaceable, never to be repeated again DNA will never step foot on this earth. In this room, on your hearts, the calling you had to step foot here tonight, that inner yearning to do right by all who have been robbed of life and wronged by abortion, that calling, it's a real one. A calling with implications far greater than whether you connected your career with your degree or followed through to become a professional athlete. The callings in this room are meant to stop genocide, to stop irreparable trauma to women and children, and they are callings to change the world. I'm not here tonight to tell you that it's going to be easy, because it isn't. It's the knock you down, drag you out, heartbreaking spiritual warfare that you are afraid of. But every time that you look into the eyes of a child who was told their life wasn't worth living, every time you witness a miracle baby being born at one pound 15 ounces, every time you hear the glorious heartbeat of a baby yet to be born, and every time you hold the hand of a woman who has carried this trauma and battle in her heart for decades over abortion, you will know that this moment of courage and this moment in the history is that moment where exactly you were needed. You were needed to be the change in the air. I believe I'm here tonight for one really obvious reason, and that is a reason only to encourage you to remember that in this war, in this battle for life versus death, you are enough. 